Isaiah 55, 6-9 Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to God our, and to our God. For he will abundantly pardon. Now right here is totally talking about salvation. Turn away from your ways. This is talking about salvation right here. And he will abundantly pardon. Why does he say abundantly? Because we have a lot of sins that he has to forgive. We have a lot of sins. Don't think you're a good person. You're just a little sinful person. Nuh-uh. Every one of us in here and everyone out there, whoever's listening to this, to this teaching, has a lot of sins. You might not know them all, but you do. That's why he said, that's why God said, he will abundantly pardon. He will abundantly forgive us our sins. Verse 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. So many times we have problems in our lives and we pray to the Lord and he doesn't answer our prayer the way we think he should. His timing isn't our timing either. We don't know what's going on. Because we're like, we're thinking it should be this way, but the Lord's doing it this way. Until we get that hindsight, then we realize, oh, that's the way the Lord took care of it. But until we see it, we're, we, sometimes we're confused. Well, don't try to figure out God, okay? Because verse 8, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. Just obey the word. That's what we're here to do. Just obey his words. Then he tells, in, he tells us in the next verse why his ways are better. Verse 9, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. What he is saying is that he's coming down to our level if, we're, if we want him to do things our way. He's coming down to our level. Do we want God to come down to our level the way we think? I don't think so. So please, don't try to understand his ways. They're not, they're, we think it should be that way. Usually, 99.9% .9 of the time we're probably wrong. Because God has his way. His, right here it says, his ways are higher than ours. We have a little, little pea brains. That's what we got. And God's brain, God's ways are higher. His thoughts are higher. So let's remember that as we do this teaching, as we do this study. Solomon was King David's son, as we know. And when Solomon died, the kingdom was split. <clears throat> there was the northern kingdom called Israel, which Jeroboam was the king, and he was a wicked man. It was already prophesied that he was going to be king. The Lord already said he was going to be king, but he didn't let people worship the Lord because he was afraid that, that it might be taken away from him. But it had already been told that he was going to be king. But he was, a, he was a wicked king. He believed in God. He knew his name. But he never accepted the Lord in his heart. He knew all about the Lord. I mean, look who his, his father was and his grandfather, Solomon, David. His family knew the Lord. And he knew the Lord too. But he never received the Lord. And then the southern kingdom was called Judah. And the king there was Rehoboam. And after Rehoboam died... His son, Abijah, became king. Now, when Abijah was king, Jeroboam was still king over Israel. Abijah was king over Judah. Uh, Jeroboam was king over Israel. And we're going to start reading about that. So if you turn to Second Chronicles, chapter 13, and verse 1. Now, in the 18th year of King Jeroboam began Abijah to reign over Judah. He reigned three years in Jerusalem... His mother's name was also Micahiah, the daughter of Euro of Gibeah. And there was war between Abijah and Jeroboam. God's people are fighting against each other right here. Okay, these are, it's Israel all together, but Jeroboam had the north of it, and Abijah had the south side of it, which was called Je uh, Judah. Now they're fighting against each other. How long are we going to fight against each other? They've been doing this since way. Are we still doing it today? 
Pentecostals and Baptists. They can't agree on anything. Church of Christ and Presbyterians. Methodists and Catholics. I mean, we all got our own ways and we all believe our ways is the right way. So God's people, even the religious people, are still fighting against each other. Just like they're doing right here. Instead of fighting against each other, we should, what we need to be doing, instead of fighting each other, oh, you got to speak in tongues and go to heaven. No, you don't. Well, I believe in the internal security. Oh, no, there's no, you know, instead of doing all that bickering over, you know, what they believe, the, what the scriptures say, we need to be together, get together and be strong in the Lord because we got the temptations of the devil and we got the temptations of the world. That's enough. We don't need to be fighting each other. But this is what they're doing right here. They're fighting each other. And we're still doing it today. Verse 3, And Abijah set the battle in array with an army of valiant men of war, even 400,000 chosen men. Jeroboam also set the battle in array against him with 800,000 chosen men, being mighty men of valor. So we see it's, it's two against one. Doesn't look good, does it? For Abijah. In verse 4. And Abijah stood up upon Mount Zimaranim, which is the Mount of Ephraim, and said, Hear me, thou Jeroboam, and all of Israel. Now, this Abijah, this king, is going to speak not only to Jeroboam, but he's talking to all of Israel. Here we see that the king that is outnumbered is going to, be, is going to start preaching. He's outnumbered two to one, but he's going to start preaching to the king and his army. And we can learn from that. We can learn from that. Even though we're outnumbered here in the world, we should still be preaching. We should still be preaching. Verse 5. Ought ye not to know that the Lord God of Israel gave the kingdom over to Israel to David forever, even to him and to his sons by a covenant of salt? He's telling them that God had a covenant of salt with King David, which means it's unbreakable. It's almost like a blood covenant with the Lord. It's a preservative kind of kind of covenant where you can't break it. We uh, have an everlasting covenant with the Lord, right? It's everlasting. Uh, and this salt covenant, if you wanted, if you didn't like somebody, and maybe you even thought about killing them, like Saul did with David, you don't have a salt covenant because you can't do that. If you're thinking about killing someone, don't have a salt covenant. Because if you had a salt covenant, you become one. Just like the blood covenant. It's, it's almost the same. You, it's like becoming blood brothers. They couldn't kill each other. It's like you don't go against your family. Verse 6. Yet Jeroboam, the son of Nepah, the servant of Solomon, the son of David, is risen up and hath rebelled against his Lord. He's saying that the kings have turned from, their, from your fathers. It's, this Lord right here is just a small L. So it's not talking about God here. But he's saying you've turned against the fathers. Solomon, David, that's his fathers. And there gathered unto him vain men, meaning the lost, the children of Baal, and have strengthened themselves against Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, when Rehoboam was young and tenderhearted and could not withstand them. So back to this vain men, not only were they lost, they were just, it just means they were useless and worthless. This is what these men were in verse 8. And now you think to withstand the kingdom of the Lord in the hand of the son of David, and you be a great multitude. And there are with you golden calves, which Jeroboam made you for gods. He's talking like he's the one. Abijah's talking like he's the one who's got the 800,000 men. Because he's talking pretty bold here. and He's the one that's outnumbered pretty badly. But he knows God is on his side. Jeroboam has his own gods, he says, which were made of golden calves, which he made for the men to worship. He's speaking with boldness, telling them, you dare, you dare go up against the God of King David? That's what he's telling them. And in verse 9, have you not cast out the priests of the Lord, the sons of Aaron and the Levites, and have made you priests after the manner of the nation of other lands? So that whosoever cometh to concentrate himself with a young bullock or seven rams, the same may be priest of them that are no gods. 
So he really starts to lay it down on them, saying, You have kicked out the priests of the Lord, which was Aaron and Levi. So that's where the priests came from. And you've made lost men from other nations to become your priests. That's what he's telling the king. You let anyone who comes with a sacrifice with these animals to be called priests. And so they're so-called gods of yours. That's what he's telling them. Now, you know, remember, Abijah is way outnumbered. Way outnumbered. But he's talking to Jeroboam, who is, who's outnumbering him two to one. But like I said, it's like he's the one who's got the 800,000 men instead of Jeroboam. And in verse 10, but as for us, the Lord is our God. Now this is what Abijah is saying. Now for us, the Lord is our God, and we have forsaken him, and the priests which ministered unto the Lord, or the sons of Aaron and Levites, wait upon their business, and they burnt unto the Lord every morning and every evening burnt sacrifices, sweet incense. The showbread also set day in order upon the pure table, and the candlesticks of gold with the lamp thereof. To burn every every evening, for we keep the charge of the Lord our God, but you have forsaken him. Then he tells them that they haven't they haven't left God, is what he's saying. They haven't left God. They're still they're still doing everything that God wanted them to do. So he's saying, We haven't left them. We still do it God's way. And then in verse twelve, and behold, God himself is with us for our captain, and his priests with sounding trumpets to cry alarm against you. O children of Israel, fight ye not against the Lord God of your fathers, for ye shall not prosper. What he's saying is you really don't want to go into battle with us and the Lord. That's what he's telling them. I mean, he's just flat out telling them. You don't want to go to battle with us and the Lord, because the Lord is on our side. Because if you do, you will not win. He's plainly telling them. He's giving them a pretty strong warning on what they're doing. He's doing some bold preaching here. Right? He's pretty outnumbered, but yet he knows God is on his side. And he's, he's, he's speaking to them with boldness. And that's the way God wants us to be. Listen to me, okay? This Abijah, he's way outnumbered, but he's, he's telling it just like it is with boldness. He's not scared to talk to them. He's not scared to preach to them. He's not scared. Do you hear me? Mm -hmm. He's not scared to preach to them. Acts 4.13, it says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. That's what Acts 4.13 says. When they heard Peter and John, they realized that they weren't Men who went to college. They weren't men who went to seminaries. It says they were unlearned and ignorant men. This is what they were. They didn't go to school. This is what they call them. But they were surprised. They were surprised at the boldness they had when they were preaching, witnessing of, uh, <clears throat> of Peter and John. And not only were they were surprised, they listened to what, he, what they had to say. What was the verse again? That's Acts fourteen. Uh, excuse me, Acts four thirteen. They said, "Hey, y'all, y'all are unlearned men, ignorant." It's kind of like me. You know, people, you know, uh, who are you? You're teaching, you're preaching. Who are you? What kind of college degree do you have? You know, I'm serious. That's. I mean, these people probably looked. They looked at Peter and John that way, and I'm sure I got people who look at me that way. Who are you? You know. You didn't even go to school. But that's okay. Because just like them, I got the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Acts 4, verse 31. Just go down a little bit. And it says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy mm -hmm. Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. After listening to Peter and John, the people prayed together to the Lord and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they went out witnessing and they went out witnessing with boldness. Don't show no hands. But who in here goes out and witness with boldness? That's the question. 
No hands, but just ask yourself, who does it in boldness? John and Peter did it here. Why? Because they were filled with the Holy Spirit. If you are claimed to be a born-again Christian, then you got the boldness. You got to let the Holy Spirit out so you can witness in boldness. Don't be scared to tell people the truth. And we have the truth. We have the truth. The absolute truth. But we're scared to speak it out there. We're scared to tell people about it. You would think that after this kind of preaching, that they would listen. Jer uh, Jeroboam and his, the people. you think they would listen. But we're going to see that they responded the way many people today. They responded the way many people of today respond. They ignored. They ignored what they were warned. They just ignored it. We're going to see in verse 13. But Jeroboam caused an ambush to come about behind them. So they were before Judah and the ambushment was behind them. So they surrounded them. So after a sermon like that, like I said, you would think they would change their mind on what they're about to do, but they didn't. After a sermon like that, saying, hey, you're going against God, God, they didn't listen. So they were surrounded. We see here that the enemy is sneaky and has no fear. Because they're the en enemy right now. And we're going to see that the enemy has no fear. Proverbs, Proverbs 1, seven says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instructions. People who don't want to live by the Bible, I'm mean, just telling you what the Lord calls them right here, okay? The Word of God says, fools. Fools despise wisdom and instructions from the Lord. Fools. Also, further down in verse 29, it says, For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They chose not to fear God. They chose not to believe it. Oh, God, nah. You know, that's, you know, when we're witnessing, a lot of times that's what we're going to get. People who are fools and they're not going to listen. There's a lot of fools out there. Broad is the way to hell. So broad is the fools out there. Okay, back to verse 14. And when Judah looked back, behold, the battle was before and behind. And they cried unto the Lord, and the priests surrounded with the, with the trumpets, sounded with the trumpets. Now get the picture. You're outnumbered two to one, and you're surrounded. Now try to get this picture. You're surrounded two to one. Okay, you can't even run because they're in front of you and they're in back of you. You can't even run. And it looks like you're definitely going to be wiped out. You're going to be defeated. That's what it looks like, right? He's surrounded. He's outnumbered. And that's what his eyes can see. Try to get that picture. So what do we do when we don't see any way out of the situation? What do we do? What, do, what did he do? We're going to see what he did. Now, as far as enemies, now in our, I'm, I'm trying to make this into our life. Our enemies, the armies that's around us, a lot of times we feel the same way. Whatever the situation might be, it's like, I don't know how to get out of this. I'm surrounded. Whatever it is. You know, so even though I'm teaching Old Testament, this goes today with today's life. I'm talking about them. We're, we're learning about what they did. But this fits us today also. So many times we find ourselves surrounded in a situation that we don't know, we just don't know what to do with it. Do we get discouraged? You know, where's the Lord? What, you know, why is this going on with me? Where is the Lord? Do we get discouraged? I mean, these are questions you ask yourself. What did Abijah do? He cried out unto the Lord. He cried out unto the Lord. I said, oh my gosh, that's what we need to do so many times. Not just cry out unto the Lord, but we need to fall on our knees and cry out to the Lord. Not just, I mean, I'm talking about really humble yourself and cry out to the Lord. When you're in that situation, it's not that, it's not like we have to beg Him. It's not that at all. But that's, that's how our humility ought to be. Where we can, where we just fall down and say, oh God, help me. He's there. He's there. But sometimes, sometimes we get too prideful. Believe it or not, there's people out there that are too prideful to do something like that. Verse 15. Then the men of Judah 
gave a shout. And as the men of Judah shouted, it came to pass that God smote Jeroboam and all Israel before Abijah and Judah. Now, this is the same thing that happened at Jericho. Remember? They shouted. All the people shouted with a great shout. And the walls come falling down. That was in Jeremiah 6.5. I mean, Joshua 6.5. What did God do? He smote Jeroboam. He smote the king and, and all of Israel. Hmm? He was surrounded. He was surrounded, outnumbered. And what did he do? He went to the Lord. Verse 16. And the children of Israel fled before Judah, and God delivered them into their hand. And Abijah and his people slew them with a great slaughter. So there fell down slain Israel, 500,000 chosen men. That's a lot of men. In fact, you got people who, who, who will take this book and say, Nah, it wasn't really that many. It's just blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, men who, men who want to go against the word of God, they better get the fear in them, don't you think? They better get the fear in them because right now they're right now they're foolish, foolish men who are trying to change. Oh, no, that's not how many men there were. No, the Bible says that's how many they were. That's how many they were. Abijah and his army inflicted heavy loss on them. 500,000 out of 800,000, 500,000 of the Israel uh, troops were killed that day. Did you, uh, are y'all getting the picture here? And this is our life. This is our life. This is a uh, uh, this is a war. This is this is what's going on here. But this is the same thing that's going on in our life. There's battles we fight all the time. Not we, but the Lord. Because right. we're supposed to just stand. Verse 18. Thus the children of Israel were brought under at that time, and the children of Judah prevailed because they relied upon the Lord God of their fathers. Now, the reason they had victory was because they relied on the God of their father, Jehovah. Notice it didn't say, now remember this right here. Remember this verse. Notice it didn't say they believed. Just giving you kind of a little hint there. It said they relied. And the scriptures are going to show later, later on in the teaching, I'm going to show you exactly what that meant. Verse 19. And Abijah pursued, pursued after Jeroboam. And took cities from him, Bethel with the towns thereof, and Joshahiah with the towns thereof, and Ephraim with the towns thereof. Neither did Jeroboam recover strength again in the days of Abijah. And the Lord struck him and he died. So Abijah reigned as king. Jeroboam was no longer thought of as a mighty warrior. He was still a king, but he had no power. And when you go against the Lord, you're taking a chance of what? You're taking a chance of being struck down and dying. I mean, that's what it says right here. That's what happened. It says, the Lord struck him dead. Verse 21. But Abijah waxed mighty and married 14 wives and began 20 and 2 sons and 16 daughters. This is not showing that it's okay to have these many wives, okay? <laughs> I mean, some people read this and they oh, look. <laughs> We're going to find out that he wasn't a man of God. We're going to find out. Even though he gave this great sermon. We're going to find out through the next verses. In fact, turn to the first Kings chapter 15. We're going to find out who Abijah is. I mean, right now it sounds like he's a, a mighty man of God, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, he gave a great sermon. Told Jeroboam, hey, God's going to do this. You did this and you did that. And we're going to find out who Abijah is. 1 Kings 15 verses 1 through 5 as I'm going to read those. Verse 1. Now in the 18th year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nebad reigned Abijah over Judah. And we just read why he reigned over him. And then verse 3, I mean verse 2. Three years reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Mahiah, the daughter of Ab Absalom. And he, now listen, this is, we're talking about Abijah here, verse 3. And he walked in 
all the sins of his father, which he had done before him. And listen, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father. This was not a godly man. He sure did sound like it, didn't he? Yeah. I mean, that was a pretty good sermon he gave. It says he was a sinful man and that his heart wasn't like his father David. You know, when David took his eyes off the Lord for a while, that's what he was, that's, that's the part of David he took after. You know, because David was a very godly man. So he didn't take that part of David, though. The part of David he took was when David committed adultery and murder. Now, it doesn't say he was a godly man like David, like I said. It says, verse 4, Nevertheless, for David's sake, for David's sake, did the Lord his God give him a lamp in Jerusalem to set up his son after him and to establish Jerusalem. So we're seeing that he wasn't a man of God. The wolves, how many times have I told you about wolves? That, I mean, this guy... He could have definitely passed as a great preacher. I mean, if you go back and listen to what he, the sermon he gave to, to uh, Jeroboam, man, you would think this is a godly man. <sighs> We're seeing that, G, that just because the Lord, this is something else. We're seeing that just because the Lord answers someone's prayer and gives them a blessing like he did Abijah. And who is Abijah? A wicked man. But... He prayed, and the Lord blessed him. The Lord gave him victory over Jeremiah, Jeroboam. And that doesn't mean that he's a man of God, though. We need to read, read the Word of God. We need to learn from these. So people who say we don't need the Old Testament, well, this is reading the Old Testament, that's how you can find out, hey, there's wolves out there dress in, in sheep's clothing, no, I'd say dress, who act and speak like they're men of God. It's shown, it plainly shows it out here what a wolf is like. Plainly. I think I'm going to title this, this teaching, which I haven't titled it, but I think I'm going to title it, We Need Spiritual Discernment. We Need Spiritual Discernment. Now, this is why I gave you the verses at the beginning. Isaiah 55, 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither your ways my ways, saith the Lord. So, okay, Jesse... If this was a wicked man, a wolf, then why did the Lord give him victory? Why? Because David, the man of God, and he was a man of God, which we'll see in the next verse, God gave this wolf, this wicked man, who was just religious. But you know, religious men can sound very spiritual also. Religious men. As we heard, he knew all about the Father, his Father's gods, and that's why, that's why he was able to give such a good sermon. Because he knew, because he, he was raised by his, his fathers, his grandfather, and they were all men of God. But he wasn't. He wasn't. It was because of his grandfather that he gave him victory. Because of David. The same goes for sickness. You know, like I said before, uh, you might have a sickness because of your parents. Because, just the same thing with David. Because of David's sin... What happened to his son? He died. His son paid for David's for his father's sin. What I'm saying is just the opposite here. It's just the opposite. This way, he was blessed because of, of his father. Not because he was a man of God, but he was blessed because of his father, David. Hope you understand what I'm saying. And then verse 5, Because David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, and turn not aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, except only in the matter of Uriah the Hittite, the, the soldier that he had killed. That's who that is. So David was a very godly man. It says he obeyed God all his life, except for this weakness he had for this woman. Now, I didn't say that's the only sin David committed. But that is a sin that David knew he was doing and did it anyway. Well, 1 Samuel 13, 14. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. So this is, I'm just showing you right here. That, God, that it's, the Bible plainly says that David, King David, was a man after God's own heart. 
But look at the sin he committed. How, you know, same thing here. How can that be a man of God? Well, we make mistakes. Remember that. We make mistakes. But we don't take that. Okay, well, look what King David did. Well, you know, I can do the same thing and get forgiven. No. What does the Lord look at? Your heart. You think you're fooling him? No. We're not. We're not fooling him. We're not fooling him. But people think they can. Because they act like Christians around Christians. But then when they go out there and they're around the lost people, they act like them. So I guess they, got, they think God only sees them when they're in church, but God doesn't see them when they're at the work, on the job, when they're telling dirty jokes, looking at pornography or whatever that may be. Huh? David was a man of God, and Jeroboam did not follow him. Neither did Abijah. As I showed you here, Abijah was a wicked king also. Now back to verse 4, it says, to give his son to be king after him in Jerusalem, back in verse 4. So we see that God wanted Abijah, Abijah's son, to reign over Jerusalem. And we'll see who that son is in the next verse. No, not the next verse, but if you drop down to verse 9, it says, And in the twentieth year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, reigned Asa over Judah. Asa took over from Abijah. And that's the reason God wanted him to be king is in that verse right there. Asa, God wanted Asa to be king. So that's why he gave Abijah victory over Jeroboam because of, because of David and also because of Asa. And then Asa, verse, if you look at it, verse 11, And Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did David his father. Now, when God compares the, this man, Asa, when he care, compares him to David, that's a pretty big compliment. Because what did God say about David? David was a man after God's own heart. So when Asa, when right here, when it says, as did his, his father, David, that's a pretty good compliment. Amen? Mm -hmm. Now, let's go back to Second Chronicles chapter 13, 13, and do the last verse. And the rest of the acts of Abijah and his ways and his sayings are written in the story of the prophet Adudu. That was the last verse. And I don't want you to get confused here. It said, you know, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is inspiration of God, right? Well, this verse, it says, and the rest of the acts of Abijah and his ways and his sayings are written in the story of the prophet, of this prophet. Now, these scriptures that we have today, the King James, they, the man translated them from the scrolls that was written, written in Greek and Hebrew. Scrolls. But they have found scrolls. I mean, you take all the scrolls they found, and it probably would be five or six foot high all right now if they was to make that the bible look at the bible we have now and we don't even read this one we really don't now the lord knew i'm gonna give them a bible that big the lord put in the king james what the lord told these men to write was the inspiration of god he knew what we needed if these if the if the rest of the story of this prophet of Abijah, I mean, was written by this prophet. Apparently, it was either saying the same thing that was already been said in some of the other books, or that wasn't important. Believe me, if it was important, God would have put it in the Bible. So you get, you have people that will take this verse and say, hey, there's other books that we don't have. This is not the complete Bible. Do you hear me? Because of this verse. Let me read it to you again. And the rest of the acts of Abijah and his ways and his sayings are written in the story of the prophet. I do. So people are like, well, where are those? We don't have all the, the whole Bible here. We do have the whole Bible. So that's what I'm saying. I really didn't even want to read this verse, but it, it's there. But I just want to let you know, there's tons of scrolls out there that's not in the Bible but God put in the Bible that we have, the Bible we have, believe me, the Bible we have has everything we need to know. 
those other scrolls that were not put in here, apparently God was like, we don't need to know that. Either it was, it's, it's either already in here in a different way or it's something that wasn't important to God for us to know. You understand? So, with this teaching, we're seeing two things. And I'm not finished. I'm finished for the night, but, <laughs> but we're seeing that Abijah, I mean, go back and read those verses where he was preaching. Read them. I mean, you, if you was to stop right there after he was finished preaching, you would think, whew, this is a man of God. He wasn't. He was a wolf. And then we say, then after we find out he's a wolf, then we're like, well, why did God give him a victory? Why did God bless him? Well, we found out God did it for David's sake and for Abijah, because he wanted Abijah to establish Jerusalem. So there's reasons why God, we don't know. Our thoughts are not his thoughts. Our ways is not his ways. Mm -hmm. Please remember that. If we read just what, what we read tonight, the question does come to you. Oh, why did God bless this wicked man? There's no way we would have blessed him if we were God, right? Because right. we would know he was a wolf. But God did bless him. But then we found out why God did bless him. Then he told us. But if, we didn't, if he hadn't told us, We'd, we'd go with, well, I wouldn't have done it that way. Right. You know, you understand what I'm saying? So there's two, two things I'm pointing out tonight. The wolf and our ways are not God's way. His ways are not our ways. That's why we need to read and read. Now, we're over here in Second Chronicles, and this First Kings is over here. First Kings comes before Second Chronicle. Now, if you read it in order, you hear about Abijah being a wicked man. And then, you hear, then you'll read in Second Chronicles what he did, and you would think, oh, he must have got saved. No. Remember, this, this book, the Bible, is not written in order. It's not Genesis. I mean, it's not written in order. Things happen over here in this book. Might have been in the same time things were written way over here in Genesis at the same time. Then you just got to learn how to hook them together. That's why when you read the Bible, there's no way you can read the Bible, just read the Bible and understand what it says. We have to study the Word. I mean, when you study, I mean, we're talking about serious studying. Serious studying. And I guess that's why the Lord made teachers, because He knew a lot of us weren't going to do any serious study. So, but the Bible is not written, okay, Genesis happened first, then that, and then so on, so on. No. Nah. You can read something way over here in Ezekiel, and it might have been at the same time something way over here at the beginning of the Bible at the same time. So it's not written in order. Remember that. These books are not in order. you could, you got to read them and then connect them. The New Testament says it, but the Old Testament shows it. The New Testament talks about wolves. Uh-huh. But the Old Testament shows you a wolf. That's... Amen? Amen.